Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Pierce, and I'm the director of the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and your host for today's conversation with Amit Majmadar, Karthika Nair, Arundhati Subramaniam, and Leticia Zakini. The Transnational Series focuses on stories of migration, the intersection of politics and literature, and works in translation. The series was launched in early 2018, and while we miss having in-person events at the store, we love having this opportunity to connect with you all virtually. I just wanna offer a quick Zoom webinar tutorial. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a few icons. One of those is a Q&A icon, where you can enter in your question at any time during the conversation. Another button will get you to the chat window. That space is there for you all. Please feel free to chat during the event. My colleague Ashley will be in the chat as well, dropping in useful information, including links to books by our authors. We do make every effort to keep these events free to attend in the hopes that you'll purchase the featured books from us. So thank you in advance for taking a look and supporting independent bookstores. And finally, you can see us, but we can't see you. So relax and please enjoy the conversation. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Amit Majmadar, Karthika Nair, and Arundhati Subramaniam to read from and discuss their new collections of poetry. They'll be in conversation with Leticia Zakini. Amit Majmadar is a novelist, poet, translator, essayist, and diagnostic nuclear radiologist. He is the award-winning author of four volumes of poetry, most recently, What He Did in Solitary. His work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, Best of the Best American Poetry, and many other places, including the 11th edition of the Norton Introduction to Literature. He is also the author of God Song, a verse translation of the Bhagavad Gita with commentary. Karthika Nair is the author of several books, including the award-winning Until the Lions, Echoes from the Mahamrata, and a principal scriptwriter of Akram Khan's Desh and Until the Lions, a partial adaptation of her own book. Also a dance enabler, Nair's closest association has been with Sidi Larbi Shikawi and Damian Jale as executive producer of their works like Babel, Words, Puzzle, and Les Meduses, and is co-founder of Shikawi's company, Eastman. Arundhati Subramaniam is the award-winning author of 12 books of poetry and prose and has been described as one of the finest poets writing in India today. She is the recipient of various awards and fellowships and has worked over the years as poetry editor, cultural curator, and critic. She is also the author of Sadhguru, More Than a Life, and The Book of Buddha, and editor of Pilgrim's India, an anthology, and Eating God, a book of bhakti poetry. And today's moderator, Leticia Zakini, is a research fellow fellow at the CNRS in Paris, currently the visiting scholar at Boston University. She writes on contemporary Indian poetry, modernism, and the politics of literature. She is currently working on a book around issues of cultural and literary freedom and the poetics and politics of modernism in Cold War India, and is part of the project Writers and Free Expression. I'm so pleased to have them all here together in conversation. And now, Amit, Karthika, Arundhati, and Leticia. Thank you so much, um, Pierce. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Arundhati, Kartika uh, and Amit for being here, um, for taking the time to discuss your work, your insights on poetry and on writing and on, on what it may be to write between worlds, between languages and belongings. So it's a huge pleasure for me to be in conversation with the three of you. And as I've also told you by email, it has been a huge pleasure to delve into your poems prior to this conversation. And I think we'll try to share uh, this pleasure as well with all of you in virtual attendance um, by having a conversation interspersed with, um, uh, with readings. Um, so I'll present briefly each of your collections and then we'll uh, have the conversation per se. So Kartika Nair's uh, Until the Lines, Echoes of the Mahabharata, which was published in 2015 with an American edition that appeared in 2019. It's a dazzling, poignant retelling of the Mahabharata in 19 voices and as many forms and registers. And also, among many other things, uh, a, pa a passionate anti-war manifesto, as David Shulman recently suggested. Introduced by a quotation by Shiwa Achebe, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. 
the epic is recast from the perspective of those who have been promised to erasure and are often the first casualties of war. The faceless, the nameless, and unremembered of history, most of whom are women, mothers, lovers, spouses, sisters, daughters. The book is also, as you have defined it, Kartika, the mutant, happily illicit child of innum innumerable ancestors. But its echoes are not only those of the multiple Mahabharatas in whose lineage you place yourself, the ocean of stories to which the epic continues to give birth, they are also echoes of and about today. And in the powerful, damaged, and enraged voices of those who refuse to be silenced, in their clamors for revenge and remembrance, their cries of grief, love, hate, and desire, we hear the echoes, the voices, and struggles of today. Arundhati Subramaniam's uh, Love Without a Story, which was first published in 2019 and internationally by Bloodex in 2020, weaves around reminiscences or snapshots of childhood, family and friendship, the wonder and the impossible newness of love, words, uncertain journeys, shared conversations and memories. Poetry, you once said, Arundhati, lets me inhabit a moment more fully um, than I would otherwise. And that's indeed what your poems do, which often reconcile an intense attention to the physical and sensual details of everyday experience with the moon gaze, a word you use, we, which can also take the form of a spiritual quest. A lot of the poems are spoken in the voice of woman and in the language of intimacy, but with the voltage, the intensity, and at times the urgency and the passion uh, that connects your poems to the devotional bhakti poets that we'll perhaps talk about later and that you admire. It's also a poetry which clears a space for pauses and for silence, but, and I quote you again, a silence so alive that you can hear listening. And that invites us also to a journey embodied in the magnificent central poem, The Fine Art of Aging, dedicated to the Tamil poet Aveyar, who has thrown off, off her last disguise and is, I quote you again, so light that she can finally take herself seriously. Amit Majmudar's What He Did in Solitary was published a few months ago in 2020. Amit, you've defined the Gita, um, of which you have, as Pierce uh, just reminded us, offered a recent translation called God Song, to which I hope we will have the time to come back to as well, as the Song of Multiplicities. And your collection is in many ways an exploration and a celebration of these multiplicities as well. The title poem, What He Did in Solitary, gesture, gestures towards a solitude, um, which is the solitary confinement of a prisoner in that poem, drawing sustenance from a fund of memories, images, and dreams, from the many lives um, he could have lived and the many things he can still, still say, feel, move, shape, and remember. In one me, there is an everyone, you also write. And this thread runs through your collection that also declines the different ways by which the I stages and estranges himself. The many other forms, pasts, incarnations, and stories that you can inhabit and that inhabits your presence. Poignancy and playfulness, empathy and tender, tenderness suffuse many of your poems that delight in recollections of childhood, everyday concerns and wonders. But the brutality of the world and history is very much present as well, from colonization and terrorism, to the opioid crisis and the Gujarat pogroms in India, to the grief and violence of carceral and hospital spaces, men, women, and boys of sorrows, mourning and survival. So after this brief presentation, um, I was thinking that perhaps we could open up the conversation um, by, by asking each one of you 
um, to talk and reflect uh, for a few minutes um, on each of your collections and perhaps on its specific challenges. Um, Kartika, perhaps you could start. Hi, thank you so much, Leticia. And it's a pleasure being back at Brookline Booksmith again, virtually and with poets and writers whom I admire a lot. Well, you've already said so much about Until the Lions that maybe it's, um, it would be more pertinent if I were just to read a little to explain, I guess, what it was I was trying to do. Because as you said, it's it's, an, it, it's a series of echoes of the Mahabharata in, in 19 voices, many of which are marginal, many of which are not, in, in as much as they are characters that we are familiar with when you know, we read or see or have had the, the foundational epic uh, read to us or recited to us. And when I was there at Brookline Booksmith about 14 months back, I, I, I'd started uh, with the, the beginning of the book. And it just seems fitting to read something from the end of the book. And you mentioned that most of the voices in Until the Lions are the voices of women. Um, this one of the, is one of the exceptions. It is the voice of a foot soldier who has been um, persuaded to join the battle by his father, um, also a former soldier, the Padati, who believes that fighting a noble war will release them from the cycle of birth and death and caste. And, and this, the poem is called Pontok, Beneath the Music, is the son's last reply. Late now, too late, father, much too late to retreat, protest, berate. This was never my battle, and I will die for others' vows and dreams, for yet another potentate, and so do a few hundred thousand men, chests ablaze, a naive, untimely, unremembered bloom of Ashoka flowers. To die forgotten is to die twice, oblivion the final demise we won't survive. No meridians, no memorials, just distance and the dead to sever then swallow the horizon, gorge the sun. It won't be long now, father, before daylight leaves my eyes. I hear night whisper traveling northward from the chest what she thinks a lullaby, traveling through spine, sinew and nerve, into lung and tongue and skin. Sludge covers my eyes, father. Or is that the hue of a chagrin sky? Soon there'll be no variance between soil and skin. Both throng me like a shroud, though my flesh scalds and the soil stings with cold. Memory seeps through torn veins. I begin to unbelong from the self, from you, from the men who were mine, like kin I used to know. Father used to know all my peers, their voices, their names. She be here, she be there, the eye of a javelin, caught his, smote him, burst the iris, spurting dark gold on eager earth. I used to know his name too, the one fallen beside me, an arm crushed to unwilled clay, both legs further, rolled further away, dragged beneath his general's chariot wheels, a blear in claret, the arc of betrayal on hard ground, and him there with an arrow twined through the rib cage next to the heart, as near, nearer than a lover's beat. Satya, Jaya, Jiva, the names collide, names and tones and functions, Padati, Sarati, Sainik, Rati. Remember them for me, Father. The dead all look the same. No tones, no pride, no traits, no whims, no gait to call our own. Save this one where, or we cannot clamor till we are claimed. 
the names remain our sole archives. Burn our spears, our lances, our shields, but swear you will chant the names of the faceless dead like a prayer, Father, and await the day when you no more need righteous warfare, nor heroes, no deadly belief, no divine stairs, no hereafter, no Kurukshetra either. Beautiful, Kaitika. Thank you. Um, Amit and Arundhati. I think Arundhati, are, are you muted? I think. Oh, hi. So, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Amit, go ahead. Oh, no, no. I, I, I thought you were muted, so I just uh, pointed that out. <laughs> I am muted, but I did say, uh, let's hear from you, Amit. I'll come on. Oh, up. sure, sure, sure. So, um, uh, you know, a wonderful reading, uh, Kartika. Um, I recently uh, just wrote uh, a Mahabharat uh, in a trilogy of novels based on the Mahabharat that I was starting coming out next year. And so this really kind of hit close to home because I think we're working in the same vein, kind of getting in touch with our, our you know, the, the heritage, I think. And, um, you know, for, for what he did in solitary, I don't think I can, I can build much on, on what Letitia so eloquently described, um, you know, because, you know, to talk about that collection, I'd basically say the same things that she, she kind of gleaned from her reading. Um, and I think one thing I can do um, is, is read a poem that sort of incorporates all of those things that Letitia mentioned, all those elements. And so <clears throat> the poem I'm going to read is going gonna, is gonna to kind of be at the intersection of, you know, the, the literary and the personal and um, India and, 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 and history and all of that. Um, it's, it's actually a poem that uh, Letitia mentioned in her email. Um, it's called Poem Beginning with a Line by Ovid. And so in this way, it kind of, it brings together the East-West classical kind of fusion thing that, I, that I'm very much into, because I'm very much into, you know, the Mahabharat and, and, and the Ramayana. I'm also very much into the Iliad and the Odyssey and the whole classical Mediterranean tradition. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> and, and, um, and this one is, um, you know, it's about, Ovid obviously wrote Metamorphoses, and it's about transformations. And the way I, the, the form of this poem, it begins with a line by Ovid, but the form of it is where it, every, every sentence, the last words of every sentence become the first words of the next sentence. So in that sense, it's kind of, there's this continuity between each sentence that resembles the continuity uh, of reincarnation. And the poem hinges on something personal in our family history, which related to my mom's uh, elder brother. And I'll let the uh, poem tell the story. <clears throat> of bodies changed to other forms I tell. Anybody who will listen. Listen, my uncle Rishi changed into a blue heron's reflection in water and stared into the sky until the sun went down on the day he died. He died of kidney failure. That was what they said in the announcement because no one died of AIDS back then, not in our family. In our family, no one died of anything, just changed to a different form, wren form, cricket form, Koi form, picked up like the end of a sentence, swung around and set down as the start of a sentence. A sentence in a new language, the tongue never twisted to fit before. Because sometimes the body that doesn't fit can be a life sentence, as it was for Uncle Rishi. Uncle Rishi would have loved to change his form to a woman's, and love a man, 
in India in the 1980s in our family. But karma says you can switch into another body only if you die. You die little by little, waiting. Uncle Rishi on all fours in his lover's flat, lowing at the sky like a heifer waiting for her milk to come in. To come into his old body after that, the flared wingspan forgotten. Forgotten the sweat on the horse's tree-thick neck was a come down, a let down, solitary confinement in his form. His form was beautiful, too beautiful for a boy. Our family used to despair of ever finding a girl to match his long lashes and full lips, my mom tells me. To this day, never saying outright the truth about her brother. Her brother became a horse and took the bit in his mouth, became a flying fish, and stole the pleasures of one body by transcending the medium he was born to. He was born to love with and be loved in that body, but his body wanted better for him. So it helped him change to another body, one that could turn and face his lover, spread for his lover thighs like heron wings and never say sorry. Sorry I've talked so long about my uncle Rishi, but this isn't something we talk about in our family. In our family, it's a pity he never found a wife beautiful enough to be worthy of his beauty before he died of an old man's disease, kidney failure, at the age I am now. Now, I should go write something else in a different form, like an essay on karma and rebirth, or an animal fable, or a sonnet I'll rewrite as four tercets and a couplet so no one can tell. Tell no one what I said here. How I dared betray the way my uncle Rishi made hoofs of his fists and knees before he died, made his gullet swallow the enormous fish, made wings of shoulder blades and flew home. His untold body changed to other forms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amit. Um, it's, it's a wonderful poem. Thank you. Um, Arunditi. Um, you know, it's the hardest thing in the world to turn from listener yeah. to speaker. So I wish I could pause here, but I know we are short of time. I would really like to listen to more of both of you, Kartika and Amit. That was wonderful. Each of you in such different ways. Love Without a Story is the most recent book. It's just been published by Blood Axe, as you pointed out, Leticia. And it's a book about, uh, what does one say? It's a book about love, but um, hopefully not the gooey sentimental kind of love. I like to believe that it's actually a book about, um, and it's about intimacy, but not, a clingy, needy intimacy, as I see it now when I look back on it, because one is never aware of this when one is putting poems together. And these were poems put together over the last five years. But now looking back on it, I realize that these are poems about all kinds of love. They're about all kinds of conversation. They're about all kinds of um, also shared reflections on time and on aging. And um, there are conversations with people of very varied persuasions, ideological, religious. Uh, it's about love across the divide of the across the sacred and secular divide. It's about conversations, as I often say, with monks and mystics and Marxists and friends and lovers and parents. Mm -hmm. And 
I was interested, I realize now looking at the poems, though I wasn't aware of this at all when I was writing them, I realized I was interested in a love that includes more than it leaves out. And there is a spaciousness of gaze in these, some of these poems that interests me now. And I realized that it could never have happened had it not been for the the absolutely extraordinary inheritance of bhakti poetry that you mentioned earlier, Leticia. The bhakti poets are these crazy, supposedly devotional poets, but poets who remind us time and again that devotion is not some kind of goody-goody, lily-livered, uh, hierarchical, subordinate relationship with God. The bhakti poets are these crazy poets of the Indian subcontinent, sometime from the sixth century onwards, who remind us that we can have a spirited uh, relationship, a passionate, sometimes erotic relationship with the divine, that we are capable of a relationship that is so intimate that we can argue, quarrel, make love to, lust for, uh, un mate with, annihilate this God. And all of it is permissible because there's a phone that shouldn't be here. All of which is permissible because um, nothing is taboo in this relationship of intimacy. And so um, what I'd like to actually talk about now is um, perhaps just to draw a couple of lines from one of the poems in my collection. It's a poem to this old woman, a crone, a poet, an archetype in many ways, an archetype in Tamil literature called Abayar. There is really no Tamilian who grows up without a figure of Abayar somewhere in her unconscious. And she fascinated me and I wasn't quite sure why until I started following her through a series of poems. She fascinated me as a traveler. She fascinated me because she's a poet. She fascinated me because she's a wise woman. And she fascinated me because she's an old woman whom we are told actually chose cronehood, actually chose old age. What kind of person would do that? And I wondered, and that is the right opportunity, I think, to read a very short poem. Abayar lives in a face where the civil war is almost over. Frayed flags of peace hoisted, cavalry slumbering, garrison emptied. Nothing to declare anymore, she says, not even nostalgia. Perhaps just a few ruined keepsakes, a bottle of limoncello from a sun-slathered June in Amalfi, a butterscotch moon from a Tel Aviv hotel, a picture of a cat, pink poured, yogic, for lovers, flatten into photographs, photographs into reminiscence, reminiscence into quiet. And then what's left? Perhaps just the oldest thing in the world, love without a story. Thank you, um, Arundhati, thank you so much. Um, you're right, it's difficult to switch from the listener to the speaker position. And I, I, I think um, I myself, and I'm sure so many of you in the audience would just like to hear the, your poems and, and uh, you know, have more time for conversation afterwards, but listen to you. Um, I had a few questions, but I think I'll, I'll just, uh, trying to link your three poems and the, the things that you each said, um, uh, I'll jump directly to a, a, a question, which is also a personal interrog interrogation. Um, the difference and the connections between poetry and storytelling. Um, and of course, that's central to your preoccupations, Arundhati, and to your collection. Um, 
And Amit, you've, you tell also a story in your poem, um, the poem that you've just read, the story of your uncle Rishi. Um, of course, um, uh, Kartika, in your retelling of the Mahabharata, you also retell a story in many voices. Um, and um, I know, Kartika, that you're also a huge admirer of Rushdi, Rushdi the chronicler, Rushdi the storyteller, Rushdi um, uh, the teller of tales and fables. Um, and your collection Until the Lions actually um, won the Tata um, Literature Live Award for fiction, not for poetry. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, 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 I would be curious to, to hear each of you on um, how, um, um, yeah, how, how that difference or that connection plays um, 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 in each of your work between, sto between storytelling and uh, between poetry. And Arundhati, I'm also reminded of something that you said and which your beautiful poem also showed so well. Um, you said th that poetry is the art of listening to the stories uh, that people don't tell. Um, so yeah, I wonder if you could just each of you perhaps comment on on that distinction or that relation. Um, I don't know who wants to start. <laughs> Shall I start? Perfect. Uh, um, it is an interesting question, I realize, because it took me time to realize that my book is called Love Without a Story, but it is in fact full of stories. And I hadn't even realized this until it was pointed out to me. But let me say this, Leticia, I think my own preoccupation with story, particularly in this book, is with myth. Mm -hmm. And myth for me is the kind of story that you never sit down programmatically to tell. You can't decide I'm going to attempt, I don't. I'm going to sit down and attempt a retelling of this great mythic story because it's good for my soul. That's not how it happens. Mm -hmm. But stories, particularly deep, rich, mythic stories, which are medicine of a kind, actually, I believe, disrupt one's life at certain moments because they're actually pointing to the fact that they need urgent attention. You need to be looking at these stories for some reason. That's how it happened to me with Shakuntala, who was a figure in my earlier book, uh, When God is a Traveler. She actually derailed my life sometime in 2003. I found myself very deeply moved by just the thought of the story, and I didn't know why. And that's when I realized, and this is what I think Kartika mentioned earlier, and A.K. Manujan talks of this too, the ways in which myth percolates into your system, and it's a part of your marrow, so you're never quite sure when you first heard it. But it has an ability to suddenly surface and demand, imperiously demand attention. Mm. Shakuntala demanded my attention. Eight years later, when she was still with me, I knew I had to make my peace with her. And so I sat down and wrote a cycle of poems. And that cycle I realized now was really my way of understanding how a complex plural legacy in Shakuntala's case, the fact that she doesn't belong to earth or sky, she doesn't belong to hermitage or court, she's horizontally and vertically conflicted. Seeing that that kind of complexity need not be conflict, that it can actually be a an inheritance to celebrate, that it can be a possibility of multiple citizenship. And that is a great possibility, not a liability. I think it took me seven poems, or was it eight, to actually discover that for myself, many years to discover that for myself. Mm. And that for me was Shakuntala. And with Avayar, I think she became for me a way of thinking about age and a way of thinking about quest and a way of thinking about what it might actually mean to live a life without the constant need to hoard, the constant need to impress, the constant need to be immortal, to freeze one's legacy, and without the constant need to please. <laughs> As I tried to understand that, I liked to believe that there would be others, women certainly, but others too, with whom that might resonate. 
Thank you so much, Aaron Desik. I just have um, a, um, an additional very small question. Um, in that same poem, um, The Art of Aging, um, you have a, a scene um, of, with Avayar who um, uh, meets a young boy. Um, and, um, at, at, and she sighs at this little, little boy at the end. And, and I, I just quote you because she knows that, she, that he will grow into men with epic stories, epic vanities, epic bibliographies, epic, epic. Uh, and I just, um, I mean, what, what you were just saying also kind of um, reminded me of that line, because there seems to be a, um, um, an opposition or between these, you know, epic stories, epic words, and Aviar, who doesn't even need a story or doesn't, I, yeah. And Aviar's own poetry, from what we know, was just a single line very often, which mm -hmm. is why I call it, I, I say she wrote one line poems, I call them epics, but whitened by a blizzard of silence. Mm -hmm. Aviar is someone who's made her peace with the pause, which is what you talked to earlier as well, Leticia. That's how I see Aviar. I see her as this woman who, and this is how the poem ends, it ends with these lines, which in many ways represent for me an aspiration. I say that she's unhurried, forever out of step, always on time. That's a bit, that, kind, that is kind of the kind of woman I would like to be. Mm. Thank you very much, Ellen Letty. Um, Kartika or Amit, if you would like to jump in. Amit, will you go first? Oh, you can go. I think it would be a natural seg from what Arundhati said to, to, to you, because you guys are both talking about, you know, the myths. If you'd like to go ahead. Well, I, I would just say that actually, um, I think everything I write, whatever the, the medium or the form used, is a narrative. So most of what I write is around dance, as you know, Leticia. And oddly enough, the very first poems I wrote about 15 years ago um, were ecrastic poems where I was um, giving myself the freedom to imagine stories around the dance pieces that I was watching or working with, starting with um, Sidira Bisharkawi and Akram Khan's duet, uh, Zero Degrees, which is about borders, which is about the the... the liminal spaces between um, countries, life and death, um, friendship and, and not friendship, um, I wouldn't call it enmity, between being and unbeing um, and, and citizenship and, and the rights that you know can be so easily taken away. And I was imagining backstories to these performances which were non-narrative. And it's, a, it's an odd thing that you know so many years later, what I do principally is script dance. And so it is find ways for the body to tell stories, which will not very often be told um, otherwise. There will be no speech, but it is a finding ways in which light and sets and accessories and music and movement, principally movement, come together to tell stories. Sometimes to tell stories that are based on existing epics, myths, legends, whether from China or India or Cuba um, or Japan, sometimes stories that only we makers would have thought about. And what we want to convey is the sensorial, sensual, kinetic experience of living through that narrative. Then there's the more obvious ways of storytelling, like the Honey Hunter or the other work I do around children's writing, fables, or a, a, a telling of the Mahabharata with Until the Lions, but even the book around the journeys in the metro, um, where I'm with Sampurna Chatterjee, my fellow writer, who was writing on the urban uh, railway system in Mumbai, what we were doing um, was charting narratives around the arterial system that are the railway networks, that are the urban railway networks, um, snapshots, but often stitched together of moments of space that becomes time. Yeah. Sure. So I think these are wonderful insights. And um, 
couple things I'd add to this. One is that I think that the divisions among, you know, the traditional divisions say lyric poetry, narrative poetry, dramatic poetry, and then the division between poetry and fiction. These are very fluid boundaries, so fluid that one might almost imagine them to be artificial sort of labels placed on it by the critical intelligence and not by the, by practicing poets. Um, I think that even when you have a supposedly pure lyric poet or poet who focuses on lyric poetry, say someone like Sylvia Plath, right? In, in the reader's head, they always have that poet's backstory in their mind. And every poem that you read by Sylvia Plath, simply by the virtue of having Sylvia Plath's name on it, it gets placed in the narrative of what you know of her life. And, the, and some of the most famous poets, and poets that really hold our imagination, often have this sort of narrative backstory in which their poems are embedded. Your experience of their poems is mediated through your understanding of their story. And so when I read something, something like uh, Endymion by Keats, there's the story of Endymion that you're reading, but you're also reading, oh, this is John Keats. He died of tuberculosis when he was 24. He couldn't marry his lady love, Fanny Braun. And it's you know, so tragic. This was the first thing and they panned it. And then he felt really depressed afterwards. And he came down with TB because he was, you know, nursing his brother who had TB and how tragic that, you know, there's always an embedded aspect to the lyric. In the history of poetry itself, some of the earliest poetry, you know, the poetry that's foundational in more than one literature, whether it's Sanskrit literature, Adikavi Valmiki, right? They call him the first poet, Adikavi Valmiki. Um, the Iliad, Homer, right? So right there, right off the bat, you have narratives and poetry and narrative are one. And today when people want to read a story, they primarily go to fiction, to prose fiction. But prose fiction, you know, in, in the larger scheme of things, historically, if you look at it from the perspective of literary history, it's sort of like a late, a late cover. And so narrative poetry is first. And then in the classical world, the classical prose novel came hundreds of years after Homer. And part of the reason for that was that um, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have as much of a scribal tradition to basically write down all this prose. So it had to be up here. All the bards had to have it on their, in their minds when they were you know, reciting the stories of the wrath of Achilles or the wanderings of Odysseus. And something similar pertained in the history of Sanskrit literature where Adikavi Valmiki comes well before the various Sanskrit prose romances and, and this and that and the fables and all that that's in prose. Um, but what's interesting is that, uh, you know, this, this element, a lot, of the, a lot of the techniques of fiction actually have their origins in poetry. And so I, in my opinion, I, I actually regard all of these things as on a spectrum. And really sometimes you use line breaks and sometimes you don't, but often what we're doing is, is, is unified. It's, it's, it's really just one activity of the mind, one activity of creating experience for your reader to sort of vicariously live through these characters, vicariously live through you and experience through you and experience through your characters, um, the, the most fundamental emotions and experiences of being human. Um, thank you very much, Amit. Um, I'm looking at the time and I know that you have to leave in 10 minutes, Amit. So um, I, I had, I had um, a question for the three of you, but maybe it's not the most interesting question. Um, um, on also on the etiquettes, uh, the critical etiquettes, and I know that um, all th three of you in different ways um, uh, have uh, criticized or been impatient or challenged with the, you know, the 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 way that you are seen also by critics, um, either as Indian Indian writers or American writers of foreign Indian origin and. Um, um, the things that critics and readers also assume of you based on your name or, you know, the color of your skin or, um, and I'm thinking, for example, of Arundhati's um, uh, poem to the Welsh critic who doesn't find me identifiably Indian. Um, and a, a lot of your poems, Amit, also in your collection are around these issues of, uh, you know, um, being from, a, you say, I think, a a, a, a brown religious minority. Um, but I know you're kind of wary also of these questions of identity, identity poetics. So perhaps I'll just jump to 
um, one question, which which is also a question that I've grappled with, um, um, and that perhaps you you um, respond to in different ways, um, on the question of um, poetry and politics, or on the question of uh, being a poet and an activist, um, how and it, in what ways can you know poets join the fight, um, and do they have to join the fight? Um, so Kartika, you've said um, um, that poetry can give pain a mouth, um, which is a quotation, I think, and, um, and that you don't make a distinction between the writer and the activist. You even say that for you hyphenated, um, uh, I mean, the only hyphenated uh, identity that you would have um, um, is that of the writer activist, and, and, and you've said in a previous conversation that we had together, how can poetry not be political? Arun, Arundhati, um, you, you, you have, have said and suggested um, that, um, you know, um, words are not weapons, they're not armors, and you've often opposed the language of the warrior or the crusader and the language of um, the quester or the poet. Um, and Amit, you've talked about your initial dislike um, 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 of political or protest poetry. Um, and then you later edited an anthology, which is called Resistance, Rebellion, Life, 50 Poems Now, uh, where you write that poets are also warriors um, because wars are also wars of war of words, sorry. Um, and that poets still have a role, which is to chastise injustice, um, uh, chastise violence and call out injustice. Um, and in that introduction to this anthology, uh, Amit, um, um, you say that today in America, no poet is dangerous enough to persecute, which is also very uh, different from the situation in India where, you know, poets and writers are persecuted, are imprisoned. Uh, so I, I um, as you can see, it's a very general question, but I just would like to, for each of you perhaps to kind of um, um, share your insights on how you see that kind of relationship between you know write uh, poetry and writing sorry uh, literature and activism and you know um yeah sure um because I, I i unfortunately have to leave in a few minutes i i, I forgive me I'll, I'll try and try and uh speak first here um yeah so i i did back in 2017 uh knaf uh contacted me as to whether i wanted to edit an anthology about political poetry and, you know, if they'd asked me a few years earlier, I would have been like, nah, I'm okay. But I think at that particular moment in that particular environment, it felt like something I was interested in doing. And I have evolved on, you know, po political poetry and the whole idea of that. Um, I do feel that there's, you know, the artist has a sovereign prerogative uh, to either engage in that or not, um, or focus on that or not. Uh, sometimes I myself, focus on the contemporary moment, on the zeitgeist, on the political situation here, there, or, 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 or anywhere. And, and I write from that, and I write from that uh, position. And then other times I go off, you know, in, in the mists of, of antiquity uh, and, and things that would be seemingly irrelevant to, to the current moment. Um, they're, they're political, but, I, but one thing I have noticed is that uh, as politics has become increasingly central to people's lives, um, through social media, it impinges on almost your every moment. Um, a political interpretation can be placed on anything that the poet does by one by someone who has a will to do so. So even when I say, look, I'm for now, for the next few weeks, I'm gonna go off into the mists of antiquity and uh, kind of just dwell in, in, in a never, never land. It's very easy to say, look, you have that, you're doing that because you have the ability to do so. You have, the, you have that because you have the resources to do so. You have that, and it's a political choice because nothing is pressing on you, forcing you into the moment and the environment. And so, you know, everything is not political, and yet everything can be political, particularly in a politicized environment. And, and so my general approach 
has been to say that has been to say that look, um, I'm going to create as I see fit, and I'm going to pursue what I choose to pursue. And whether that's consciously political, unconsciously political, um, the result of my privilege, the result of my particular place in geography and, and era, um, I'm going to leave that aside. Sometimes I'll be consciously political. Other times I'll be, you know, apolitical, at least from my own mindset. And I will, you know, and, and really where that falls or how that's interpreted, I can leave to other people. Because in the end, for my own poetry, my own fiction, whatever I write, you publish it and the world comes to its own conclusions one way or the other. And I definitely think that poets have a role if they so choose. I also think poets have the absolute prerogative to, to do whatever they want and to not think about it if they don't want to think about it. And, and that's why, you know, for me, both in my own praxis and in what I tell younger poets when they come to me and they say, look, you know, is this what I, you know, is this what I have to do? I'm not, you know, I don't want to be that kind of poet. I say, look, you do whatever you want, you know, and people are going to come to their own conclusions and people are going to put their own spin on it if they want to. And they can spin it where you're, you know, they can spin you as being someone who's not, you know, relevant, or they can spin you as someone who is transcending it. They can put any, a positive or negative spin on it. You just do what you do. You follow your bliss. You follow your bliss as a writer, as a poet, as a thinker, and as a person in your own life. And, 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 and that'll stand you in good stead. And that's, that's kind of how I, how I have come to regard it over time. Thank you, Amit. I see that Pierce. Um... I have joined. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Amit, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have only a couple more minutes. So I wanted to ask this question that's in the chat specifically for you. Sure. Um, can you please talk a little bit about your writing process? How and when do you write? Do you craft your poems with a theme already in mind? Um, you know, my practice is very much catch as catch can. So I, I frequently write, you know, write after I wake up in the morning. I've kind of fixed it. So I have with, I, I'm a radiologist and so I have shift work. And so, you know, you start at a certain time, you end at a certain time. I try and get shifts that start later in the day. So past couple of days I've been working, my shift starts at 4 p.m., which is basically, you know, a few minutes. And then I go and I start that shift. And so I have, you know, after I wake up, I have a bunch of hours in the day hang out with my kids, you know, hang out with my wife, work out, you know, eat light. And then, you know, my, my brain is firing. I'm still really awake. And I just, I just, I just do it. I just, I just try and get that time in uh, whenever I can. Other times I have to work other shifts. Sometimes I work overnight shifts. Sometimes I work 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. Sometimes I work 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. And then you just kind of have to just find your way into that, those little spaces in time uh, when, when, when you can kind of center yourself zero in on what you want to do. Um, as far as writing poems with a specific theme in mind, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. And I'm very much a follow your bliss kind of guy, very much catch as catch can. And sometimes I will, I will, I've written entire poems, successful poems, where I have just riffed on a sound. I had like a, I like, this is the V sound poem. I've done that, you know, other times I'm like, I'm going to tell a story about, you know, this uncle of mine from back in the eighties. Um, and so, so really there's so many ways to write a poem. There's so many ways to write a poem. I tell people, you know, I tell younger writers when they ask me advice, I'm like, just, just try stuff, you know, try stuff. And you don't have to have a theme in mind. You don't have to have a tone in mind. You can just, just, just let it run. Just let it go. No one has to see your failures. And I'm kind of, and that's what I, that's another thing that helps me, um, write is just being unashamed of my failures. You know, I'm just unashamed. And, and that's kind of my process is to just, write whenever I can, uh, uh, be unafraid of failure and, and just try and try and just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. That's, that's basically my process. Anyway, thank you all for, for, for inviting me. And, and I love yeah. listening to all of you and I wish I could stick around a little bit more, but unfortunately duty calls. So, um, yeah, thank I, you for joining thank us you so much. Lovely. I will leave the screen and let you all get back. Kartika and Arundhati, um, I wonder if you want to pick up on um, the last question. Um,
Kartika? Well, it's something you and I have spent many hours and days and weeks talking about, uh, Leticia. Uh, so I'll be concise now and just have a two-pronged approach. Um, I, I do, I do uh, you know, uh, rejoin Amit um, when he said one should have the freedom. You know that I often quote, again, my um, choreographer associate, Sidi Larvi Sharkawi, uh, that artists should have, you know, oh, there's no should, again. Uh, it's both mantra and armor is should me no shoulds. So an artist, I think, should be able to write or, or paint or make whatever it is that they choose to. So, you know, there's absolute, there should be absolutely no restriction as to whether it needs to be any one or several things, political or non-political. That said, uh, for myself, um, I see politics as going back to its root of a citizen. And I think that is what I am and what I am responding as, even when I don't or didn't uh, have citizenship. So I respond as a being who is um, engaged in a certain world. And, and being an artist is one part of who I am, uh, perhaps the part that's most urgent for me and perhaps the part where I uh, can chisel my practice the most and therefore it's just it's just organic that it should be an extension of whatever it is that I believe in the most mm. yeah thank you um Kartika. I'd say that um you know the the article that you actually spoke of Leticia where I speak of uh, armor words as weapons. That's a very specific poem that I was actually alluding to. It's a poem called Words in my very first book. And I was actually making the point there that a kind of um, that vulnerability, a chosen vulnerability can in fact be a very deeply political statement. Mm -hmm. So I really wouldn't want to fall into some kind of naive opposition here between, uh, you know, what is purely poetic and what is purely political, because there is no such thing. There is, these are very useful terms when we're having a conversation, but we know that there is no such thing. We know that the political is oozing into our uh, bloodstream every moment, just as everything else is. The question then is how do you process this very uh, rich, complicated, fraught world that you live in? How do you process it? How do you make sense of it? How do you then, how does it find articulation? So in my case, there could be, um, chest thumping um, poem, a rant poem, like the Welsh critic. It's, it's a poem, it's called to the Welsh critic who doesn't find me identifiably Indian. It's a rage poem against all those who try to fit us into uh, pigeonholes and categories that are limited and dogmatic in one way or the other. But there are also poems, and this is also what I feel we need to make sure that there is room for that to be political does not mean adopting a single tone. It doesn't mean a tone of um, woundedness and indignation all the time. There are many ways in which the political can be articulated. So I have very quiet poems. There is a poem in my previous collection called, I speak for those with orange lunchboxes. I believe that is a political poem. It talks about my constituency. It talks about my tribe. It talks about the people I come from, the place I'd like to belong. That to me is as much a political poem, but it's just worded, it's coded, its tone is different. Likewise, I have a poem in my most recent collection called Mitti. Mm -hmm. Mitti is mud in Hindi. And for me, this is a poem about, actually it's about ecology and it's about cultural diversity and it's about linguistic variety and plurality, but none of this has to be underscored it's there. It's just as much a part of who I am, the political, as in fact mud is. Mm. So the mud and the stars in this poem, I speak of the poet's role as the bridge between moon and mud mm. and everything in between. So how can we create these binaries really where there are none? Um, thank you, uh, Arundhati. Yeah, um, 
that clarifies and and um, and I guess that uh, Kartika would be um, would agree <laughs> with what you've just said. Um, um, who says that uh, the Honey Hunter, her children's book, is as much political as uh, any other um, um, political um, um, poems? Um, um, perhaps I'd, I'd like to ask you a question on, um, it, it's mostly for Arundhati, but I'm sure, Kartika, that you would have things to say as well um, about um, um, the spiritual journey and the poetic journey. Um, um, so Arundhati, your, your spiritual journey and your literary journey seem um, to go hand in hand. Um, um and um uh and yet you've said that it's 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 been difficult um perhaps because uh lines are drawn um to hold them together or to hold them together publicly um um you said that you 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 have been a, a closet seeker for a very long time but now you stopped being a closet seeker um and um, um, uh, so, so in what ways um, are these journeys connected? And um, uh, Kartika, um, how would you perhaps relate to that question? Um, uh, would you say, uh, like Arun Kolatkar, whom um, you love, <laughs> as Arun Dati and as I do, um, that when asked uh, if um, you know, he believed in God that you would just leave the question open um, and that you don't think you have to take a position on God in um, one way or another. And that, you know, the Mahabharata, the Bible, the Quran are literature um, um, and not sacred texts, but you see them as literature. Um, um, so how, how do these, um, yeah, how does, how does, I don't know if how it's more of a comment perhaps than a question, but um, if you could both um, perhaps um, um, respond to that uh, comment and question, um, and I'm sure differently um, perhaps. Kartika, would you like to go first? Um, wh why don't you go first, Arundhati? Come later. So yes, I think that for many years I was what you said I was, a closet seeker, Letitia. I felt that um, these had to be different rooms in my life and that the door couldn't quite open from one into the other. But I didn't have a, really a very much of a choice when they did open. So when that happened, I call it the, the great derailment in my life, when in fact, I found myself in a very dark place with no language to hold on to. And that's when I realized that I couldn't pretend to be someone who had found all my answers in the arts, which is the general uh, uh, public persona that I had, you know, very much a person of the arts. I wrote on the arts. I wrote on dance and in the performing arts and I loved literature and I practiced poetry. But I realized at that point that language didn't rescue me. And as I started crawling out of this uh, place of wordlessness, the only thing I could acknowledge was that I was a seeker and mm -hmm. I was ready to look for crumbs of guidance wherever it came from. It was not a terribly dignified place to be. It was not an easy place to be. And there was no poetry there either. Many years later, when poetry returned to me, it returned to me differently. And it returned to me with a much deeper realization that, um, I came out with a much deeper realization of what poetry was, I think, for myself, that it was not just the art of language. It is really the art of, uh, that consciously embraces pauses, that there is a reason why there are all those blank spaces on a page of poetry. There is a reason why there are so many silences in a poem. And uh, I had in some way to acknowledge those rather than ride roughshod with a certain sense of hubris, as I had done earlier, enjoying craft, which is a wonderful thing to do and which I still do, but um, realizing also that there are other places 
that offer language its source and its octane. And it was acknowledging that that was for me very important about poetry. And then later I found I had another whole literary ancestry that I had never dreamt of. You know, so I grew up thinking of myself as, well, I was a Bombay poet. I was surrounded by, you know, all the other wonderful Bombay poets of the time. There was Nissim Ezekiel and Arun Koletkar and Eunice D'Souza and Adil Jasavala. It was a tremendous uh, environment to grow up in. And of course, it was the Anglo-American canon that was also a part of my legacy. And it was gradually, I read, I grew up loving Zen poetry and Neruda, but it was after this particular tryst with silence that I began to understand what the Bhakti poets were about. And they rescued me in a way that I hadn't quite imagined that they would do earlier. They'd interested me earlier, they'd sometimes provoked me earlier, but I felt uh, much more connected to them as, um, as part of my genealogy, as it were. That mm -hmm. happened afterwards. Mm -hmm. And just if I can add, uh, Arundhati, it's, it's, uh, you have a, um, not a definition, but a relation with Bhakti. I mean, you see them, you, you, for, for example, you create, you curated, sorry, a festival of uh, Bhakti poetry, um, two festivals of Bhakti poetry, and uh, their titles are eloquent. Um, one is Wild Woman, and the other one is Stark Raving Mad. And you know where that comes from? It comes from a Poletka poem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poletka's yeah. translation. Yeah. Everything but, as you said, um, you know, tepid um, uh, religiosity or um, obedience or uh, everything but that. Everything but that. Mm. And, you know, you talked to stances earlier, you know, and I think the great thing about so much sacred literature is in fact that it is challenging stances, mm -hmm. especially stances that are taken without journeys, attitudes that are adopted without process. And if there's one thing that the Bhakti poets do again and again is take very deeply unconventional stances, in fact, to challenge mm -hmm. uh, subtle levels, insidious levels of attachment to current positions. So I think they work um, in, in all kinds of seditious ways that I wasn't aware of when I first read them. Mm. Mm. Um, thank you, Arundhati. Kartika? Uh, so forgive me to begin with, because I'm going to ramble a bit, but um, I think it helps a great deal to have been brought up in a, in a clan that was quite mad quite effortlessly, casually, maybe even thoughtlessly ecumenical. So, um, you know, you had people following every religious practice, uh, including um, family that would be staunchly communist. Um, others who maybe, whose only God was Kurosawa or, or another filmmaker. So um, I can see that um, my, my um, Bangla friends are here as well and that in, in India one says that that's sort of very uh, you know very proper to both Bangla and Kerala-like families uh, anyway it was true of mine so it really helped to grow with uh, in an environment where the multiple was the norm mm -hmm. and maybe maybe in that sense what was most sacred was the space to disagree and I think it is that that I miss the most in today's India and not just India all over the world. Um, am I religious? I'm not but I grew up in an environment where everyone was free to be very religious and like I said religious about something as you know unorthodox as a filmmaker or, or a style of filmmaking or communism uh, or the outliers because like uh, Anandati said the bhakti poets, saints, the Sufis, um, they were great outliers. They challenged what was the norm or orthodoxy as you know, we refer to it, or the traditional um, conduits towards the divine. And, and some of the greatest art, I think what I take away from religion and spirituality is mostly that. Some of the greatest art, some of the greatest thought has been triggered by belief or faith or the desire to mm. become one with the divine but religion and faith um, have also unleashed some of the greatest horrors uh, in history 
Um, and they're both sides of mankind that, you know, one, one lives with and one perhaps dreads and perhaps needs to uh, tame, apprivoiser, as, as, mm -hmm. as one uses uh, the, the word in French with so many connotations. Um, you're right. Um, I look at all the sacred te texts, whether it's the Bible, whether it's, um, which incidentally I read uh, even before uh, the, the Hindu religious texts as uh, part of that crazy plan, like I said, uh, all of the sacred texts are for me primarily great sources of literature, great outpourings of the imagination. And I do think that the imagination is humanity's one redeeming feature. Hmm. Thank you, Kartika. Um, brilliant. It's just wonderful to be able to speak to the to, to, to the two of you and to the three of you just before. I think um, we have to wrap up in not too, um, yeah, not too long. So perhaps we could just end um, by a reading of um, one poem each. Um, that would, I think, be a, a great way to end this conversation, if you're okay with that. Sure. I'm not sure what to read, Kartika. Why don't you read? I'll think of something in the interim. Um, well, we spoke about a lot of serious things, so maybe a little bit of pleasure. Uh, just, um, I think I'll read this uh, poem from Until the Lions, which is called Blood Moon Rising. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a poem in which a maid who has to seduce a sage uh, who would have otherwise slept with her mistress and the sage is someone the mistress is trying to avoid so the maid steps in but the difference between this and some of the other you know voices in until the lions and in the mahabharata is that this is a voice with great agency this is a woman who is completely assured of what she intends to do um so yes um blood moon rising this is purna to vyasa who is traditionally known as um, the the author of the Mahabharata, um, the first writer, so to say. Okay. So, yeah. uh, just give me a second while I find the poem. I'm just going to read an excerpt because it is quite a long poem. Begin with the labia, Lord. Make me a word, swift and feather light, a flurry beneath the philtrum, nuzzling the upper, then lower lip, teasing teeth apart, swirls on tongue tip and blade and root that carry ribbon lightning to the brain, the smoky wine sting of caresses on a hard palate transform from noun to verb these lips, savor, brush, sip. For tonight we need no food to dine. Should anyone ask for my keepsake, my sign of birth or station, tell them, Lord, nothing matters but this night song. With alap of twine tongues, tatters of pulse that will drip in tintal, the rag bahar of your breath deep beneath within my throat. Hip and thigh, shaft, pubis, in long bandish, flesh to flesh, that shatters thought and time. For mating, like music, is no race, no clocks await at start or finish. Pleasure shared stays the sole prize and keepsake. As faces change, voices drift, signs wilt. Save its five-chambered heart, treasure misplaced by gods. Write the color henna, sign the name grace. Name its fragrance earth, color its music midnight. Label the shape, desire, relic once more from heaven. Lovely. I'm trying to think of uh, 
I thought I would read a shorter poem, but I'm going with Mitti because I actually mentioned it earlier as a possible poem that was, uh, that could be seen as political and really about uh, the role of poetry and the role of poets. So Mitti, which in Hindi means earth, mud. As a child, I ate mud. It tasted of grit and peat and wild churning and something else that I could never quite find a name for. Later, I became a moon gazer, always squinting through windows, believing freedom was aerial, until I figured that the moon was a likely mud gazer, longing for the thick sludge of gravity, the promiscuous thrill of touch, the license to make, break, remake, and so I uncovered the old language of poets to be messengers between moon and mud. And I began to uncover the many languages of earth that have nothing to do with nations and atlases and everything to do with the ways of earwigs, the pilgrim trail of roots, the great longing of life to hold and be held and the irrepressible human love of naming. Ooze, mire, mignon, humus, dirt, silt, mold, loam, soil, slush, clay, shit, manne, matope, baro, tinen, ni, luto, fango, all have their place, I found, in the democracy of tongues. None superior, none untranslatable, all reminders of the anthem of muck of which we are made. Except when June clouds capsize over an Arabian sea and a sleeping city awakens to an ache so singular that for just a moment it could have no name. Other than that where sound meets sense and a slop of matter meets a slick, lunatic wetness. Mitti. Just that. Nothing else will do. Thank you very much, uh, Arundeti. Thank you both um, for this wonderful um, conversation and reading. And I think Pierce um, just joined us for um, questions of the audience. No, actually, that was the last question, and I think that's okay, because that was such a beautiful place to end it. I think all of the audience members are just in raptures with the poems that you've just read and have no questions in their head left. Um, <laughs> but thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Karthika, for coming in from Paris, Leticia, for moderating this beautiful event. Um, yes, thank you, everyone, for coming. We're getting some thank yous in the chat. Arundhati, thank you so much. And we do have on our shelves right now a nice lovely book, Until the Lions. And even though technically it doesn't come out here in the US until March, if you desperately want Arundhati's book right now, we have it on our shelves in the store. Lovely. Thank you all so much. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Leticia. Thank you, Kartika. And thanks in absentia to Amit. Yeah. It's kind of uh, what we call in India an adda, which was, uh, which was one that I, I wish it could, I really do wish it could continue. But thank yeah. you for making this happen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pierce and Leticia and Arundhati. So amazing hearing you again. Mm. Lovely. I don't want to cut anyone off. We've got some lovely messages in the chat. Just lots of thanks and lovely compliments to all three of you. Wonderful. Well, I will end it now. Thank you all. Have a lovely day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you again. Bye.